Audio Design Workshop Live, a series of masterclasses for audio product designers. This video provides a brief glimpse of the recent Audio Design Workshop Live in Cambridge, UK. We have um, a question from the web, actually. Yeah, this is another question for Tony Waldron. This time it's regarding XLRs. As you can see, I used to be a cartoon. Things have uh, not got much better, but we're going to talk about giving input circuits maximum immunity. And uh, I'm going to show you how to minimize radiation from any design, which is all very important. And then right at the end, we'll have a little look at uh, Class D amplifiers because they're uh, uh, rather important nowadays. I'm a test and measurement product specialist at Prism Sound. So I spend uh, pretty much all of my time either doing measurements on my bench or helping other people um, perform audio measurements on their test bench. So we will look at input interfaces, we will look at signal processors, we will look at power amplifiers and also the electric electroacoustic components of our active loudspeaker system. So firstly for Simon, I was just wondering if you uh, have included real speakers in the amplification test. I was rather suspicious of the use of resistors to reflect the speaker load. And then um, this is really for the whole panel, is you're all kind of measurement nuts and that's cool, I understand that, but where's the mystery in hi-fi now? Uh, what, where's the bit we, we can't measure? <laughs> Martin? I would say something about the being cage for. Okay, so we're going to start off at 500 hertz. You can see that the frequency has changed and the amplitude is being ramped up and down automatically by the generator. See, hands off, I'm not touching anything. This is all happening automatically. We're now up to the 1 kilohertz tone in this sweep. You can see the um, distortion reading updating in the bottom right hand side of the screen here. So it's getting higher and lower as we're hunting out that sweet spot on the THD plus N curve. We've now uh, reached 8 kilohertz. This is the final part of our sweep. And there we go. The interesting thing about that is you only need it on the day that you're inventing and evaluating the new encoding standard because after that it's a test vector problem. I mean if you... Yep. Uh, <laughs> Whereas other things that were new when, when digital taught us how we could screw things up in a really interesting way was, was things like Jitty, you know, because the, you know, things that were very perceptible were impossible to detect with conventional measurement equipment in those days. They were producing sidebands that were so close to the fundamentals that they were being taken out by the third octave filters. And, you know, we really needed a new generation of, of test equipment you know, measuring you know, in different ways. Just and we got it from you guys, thank you. That's absolutely <laughs> true, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Oxford Digital, for those who don't know us. Um, we're going to look at some typical active speakers, uh, look at the problems associated with the speakers, um, and then talk about how we actually got into the tuning business, which is actually quite interesting. Um, look at what the theoretical solutions are, and then look at how we can actually deliver practical solutions. Now, I'm going to push the auto button, and you'll see that it will automatically do the best it can. And you'll see that there's a tracking number at the top that's telling you how well it's doing. I put in a particularly um, silly selection of pole, initial pole positions just to see what would happen. Um, and had I been doing it more intelligently, it would have converged faster. But anyway, it's, it's now converged, and it's given us a tracking number of 2.1 dB, which is uh, entirely adequate. So we're going to take a look at these subjects. We will show some design actually done with fine motor, some quick examples. These speakers that we have designed in fine motor, we will import into fine box and see what will happen with the system of the driver and the box. Then we'll take a look at fine cone and just a sneak preview to, to look at what a breakup will do to the response of a loudspeaker. Then we will look at a QC testing with fine QC and we will take a look at fine R&D which is using the same hardware but just for common R&D work. 
Then finally, we will look at some uh, system systems with fine crossover. Fine crossover is actually for passive crossovers, but there's still some good information you, you can get from it. Here we see lots of breakup, and there's lots of activity in the dust cap. But the main thing is that the outer half of the cone is breaking up, and the surround not really participating. So this is a pure cone mode. This is actually the first real cone mode. And this large excursion here is producing the large peak. And this happens in, every, in any loudspeaker. You can move it around and modify it, but it's more or less always there. I was fascinated by, by the, um, the bit where you showed um, simulating the cone breakup. Yeah. Um, and you could, you could input different sorts of cone material and so on. But I wonder how you get the, the cone material data in. I was thinking, for instance, if you wanted to simulate one of these laminated cone designs. Mm -hmm. So if you're developing new cones, then um, uh, uh, the, the complexity of inputting the data for the, for the cone material, surely that's as, almost as much of a problem as <laughs> simulating yes. the, uh, the that's performance. That's true. Join us in person or on the webcast for the next live masterclass in Helsinki on August 21st, 2013. Our distinguished team of audio experts will be joined by Lars Risbo of Texas Instruments and Wolfgang Klippel of Klippel GmbH, both discussing DSP applications in audio signal processing. For further details, visit www.prismsound.com forward slash ADWL.